We will now have a hymn of adoration. We're marching to Zion. Hymn number 524. It's so good. We ain't got nothing to do with it. Okay.
it's a man's world today. <laughs> Church loves you also. You come here and you've done 
great things for us. You've, you've rebooted us. Amen. And we thank you for that. We thank God for sending you to us. You have heard today and saying that it's open, open book to us. And we thank you guys for that. And you guys have shown us how to continue to serve God in the best way that we can. So we thank you. I thank you. I love you. God bless you on your birthday and anniversary. Amen. Now we have a presentation by Deacon Tyrone Anderson.
You can also use the box, the gift box in the front of the church uh, when you enter. All the and also you can give uh, use Givelify, uh, the application to give. But when you choose Givelify, please make sure you set Zion Baptist Church South Richmond because Zion Baptist Church is a common name among churches. So make sure your funds go as intended. Seven, four, seven. Right. If I get something. Oh, that was hard. I thought it was somebody else. Right. Okay. Here we go. Acts 20, 35. Paul states, I've shown you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And those of us that do give, we recognize that joy. It's not about what God can give back to us. And he does bless us over and over again. But the joy that comes in our heart when we help those in need, the joy that comes in our heart when we give to support God's work here on earth, uh, you feel it, you know it, and you look forward to it. So let us pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the many, many blessings that you poured in our lives, Lord. Blessings that we did not even deserve, but you blessed us just the same. And Lord, we choose this moment right now to give back a portion of those blessings to your work, your kingdom here on earth. Lord, so now that we ask that you will bless these gifts and you will bless the givers. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we do pray together. Amen. 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 Please rise for the doxology.
And let's keep praying for our church. Amen? Amen. Because what? Greater is He. And greater is Zion. Amen. We expect what? Greater things. Because we serve a great God. Amen, somebody. Amen. Be encouraging a little.
And he trembled and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into the mountains. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at the marker's name, Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saint at Jerusalem. And here he had authority from the chief priests to bind all that call upon thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel. The Lord have a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen.
but by the word that your word has been declared. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. From the reading of Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 15, I'm not going to read all of it. You can read it at home. I'm going to go straight to where the Lord's going to be lead to, and that's verse 15. And I, excuse me, Acts chapter 9, verse 15 says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. I want to tag this text and speak from the subject, I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. No matter what your perception on change may be, we must all realize that change is necessary. It is a necessary part of life. Some of us welcome change, others of us despise change, and some of us deny change. And I'm not talking about the change of the shape of your body fit. I'm not talking about the change of the color of your hair. I'm not talking about the change of the house that you live in. I'm not talking about the change of anything external. I'm talking about the change of what's internal. I'm talking about where God changed your motives from making you think that's right when you were wrong. I'm talking about when God changes you when you were right in one season, but the season has changed, you didn't realize it, when you were right, but now time has changed, now you think you're right, but you're now wrong. I'm talking about the change that comes, that, 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 that life invites you to change, but you want to stay stuck. Life will cause you to change, particularly when God's moving. Life will teach you to change, but the question is, are you realizing that the change is taking place? Some of us remember a TV show called Family Matters, where the family was named the Winslows. And they were a loving family, but they had a neighbor that lived next door to them by the name of Steve Urban. Steve was a nerdy, Pesty, bothersome, worrisome neighbor. Steve was the kind of neighbor that was had the unwelcome invited to come to your house when he always was there. You know anybody like that? They not invited, but they just show up anyway. Okay, just look at me. They might be in here. Just look at me. And Steve was this kind of guy. Every time he went to one of those home, for some odd reason. He would knock something over. He was clumsy. He was nervous. And Steve was in love with their daughter. Laura. Laura. But Laura could not stand his guts. So she said. So one day, Steve, although he was a nerd, clumsy, bothersome, but he was a smart young man. But every time he knocked something over, he would say something like this. Did I do that? Yes, you did that against Steve. So Steve got tired of being a nerd. He got tired of people calling him a nerd. He got tired of all this. So Steve decided, I'm going to build myself a machine. Steve built himself a machine. He no longer was called Steve Urkel. He's now... Stephen. Stephon. There you go. Let's see who paid attention. <laughs> Stephon Urkel. I'm glad y'all are here. He's no longer clumsy. He's no longer a nerd. He's now the coolest guy in the neighborhood. The girls now flock to him. Even Laura who could not stand his guts, now starting to like Steve. All because Steve had a radical change. 
It was radical because he moved from being a nerd for being popular. Such is the case and circumstances in, on the other side in our text this morning. We are introduced to a man by the name of Saul that many of us know him as Paul. The same Paul who built churches. The same Paul who encouraged people. The same Paul who proclaimed the word of Jesus Christ. The same Paul who was called the apostle. The same Paul who was a Grecian, who spoke seven different languages, who lived in the Jewish law. The same Paul who was also a Pharisee. The same Paul who knew Gomillion, who was a tutor, excuse me, who was a teacher, who was a student of Gomillion. His tutor, Gomillion, who was one of the, the most popular theologians of the time. Paul sat under his tutelage. Paul, the one who suffered. He was known as a great man. Uh, he was an Orthodox Jew. His mom and daddy raised him that way. He was the man by the name of Paul. Yeah. He, he told us how to love people. How to encourage others. Paul. The one who proclaimed that, that for Christ I live and for Christ I die. I'm talking about Paul. Y'all know him, don't you? But before he was Paul, he was Saul. Never measure a man from what you see in him now. You must know where he started from. Because before he was Paul, the tent builder, he was Saul, the terrorizer. Before he was Paul, the church maker, he was also known as a coatman who was hanging coats for his other men of the law of the land. He was the one who abided by the law, who was persecuting the people of God. The text says, as he was on his way, to the masses. Oh, have mercy. He was going there for the purpose of committing murder for those who were called the followers of the way. Before we were called Christians, we were called followers of the way or Christ-like. Matter of fact, it was the it was the enemy who called us Christians. Christians didn't name ourselves Christians. You became a Christian because you were a follower of Christ. And as a follower of Christ, Paul was persecuting, murdering those who were following Christ. And before we looked at him, look at him funny, he was what is called a monotheistic worshiper. He worshiped God. And to his credit, he did not want anybody to give the credit but God himself. So how could anybody call themselves followers of Christ? That Paul did not know Christ. He knew God. So he thought. Help me, Holy Ghost. And as a follower of God and not Christ, Paul thought it was harmful for those who were following Christ. At the time, not realizing that Christ has risen. It was now, it was, it was now a new day. Watch this. Paul was wrong, but he was right. He was wrong because he used the Paul to worship God. He was wrong because now he didn't realize that Christ has come in the name of God. He was right for a season. But the season has changed. But he didn't realize the season has changed. But he's still operating in the old season. How many of us don't realize that the season has changed? And we do Church of God, Damascus is a process. 
approximately 150 miles northeast of Jerusalem. Remember, they didn't have cars, they didn't have Ubers, they didn't have bicycles, they didn't have airplanes. They had to walk everywhere they were going. Okay? They did not have smooth pavements. Black tar streets. They were living in a dusty road of Palestine. It was hills. In fact, if you go there now, there are hills and rocks and mountains to climb. So Paul was going 150 miles just to stop those who were claiming, pro proclaiming Christ. That means that he was determined and arrogant enough and so self-righteous enough to say whatever it takes, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there because they can no longer spread the gospel. I'm going somewhere. All right. All right. So he's on his way. But as he's on his way, Paul thought he was doing a service to God by getting these followers of Christ and persecuting them. Paul was lost and misguided. He might, he might thought that he was right, but he was wrong. Before we look down at him, before we shake our hands at him, before we say anything about him again, think about the times you thought you were right. And nobody can tell you anything different. You had it, all the right answers. You wrote the playbook, you gave the homework, and graded the homework. You were doing this until you got knocked off your high pride. There are those who say that Paul was knocked off the horse. No, that's not what the text says. The text says that Paul was knocked down to the ground. Paul was knocked down because of his self-centeredness. He was knocked down because of his pride. He was knocked down because of his self-righteous ways. Paul thought he was morally right, but his motivation was wrong. As he was on his way, the text says he met God. Paul was religious, but not righteous. How many of us can testify and tell the truth that you may be religious, but you're not righteous. Paul knew of God, but to know of God, but have received Christ, is just missing the mark. Paul had it all right, but he was all wrong. And someone said, just because you're right and halfway wrong, means you're still wrong. There's no in between. The Bible Shut if you will. 
But every time the shepherd tried to guide him, he kicked back the dirt. And the dirt came on back in his face. What he was saying was, listen, Paul, you are hurting yourself because I'm trying to draw you close to me. And you fight against me. You're not fighting against those who call by themselves Christians, but you'll fight against me because I'm the one who are leading them. How many of us fight against our own purposes that God has called us to? How many of us think that we got it going on? As a result, Paul life was changed. Watch what he does. Saul, he goes to the high priest and asks for a letter. He said, listen, I need a letter. The text of the message is everyone after them. Watch this. Look who gave Paul permission to kill other Christians. The church. Y'all didn't see that coming. It was the one who represented the church was the one who said, Paul, listen, so go and get them. How many of us persecute our own selves? How many of us talk about the church worse than the world talk about the church? How many of us put the church name out there on the street of danger when we're supposed to be promoting the church, but we put the church in danger? You hear it? So called Christians say, I can't believe they're doing that. The church not doing anything. Talk back to me if you can. He got from the priest. But as he's on his way, he had a, what I call a transformation for life. Like Saul, perhaps Saul here this morning, attend church, doing some good things. I think because these things are good. And you think it's all well. Yes. In other words, you enter into the church, but never had an encounter with Christ. Right. Here's the good news. Christ wants to have a relationship with you. Yes. Yes. This is exactly what happened to Saul. As a result of his life-changing encounter with Christ, Saul was forever changed. The Bible says for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. God spoke to a man named Ananias in a vision. He said, listen Ananias, I want you to go to the house of Jews on a street called Straight, on J Street. And ask for a man named Paul. God changed his name as he was going on the way. I'm going somewhere. See right there. For he is praying and has seen a man in a vision by the name of Ananias. Watch the genius of God. God said that Paul was praying, but he would see Ananias in a vision, and Ananias saw Paul in a vision. Which means that God just gave directions, but he blinded him at the same time. As Ananias was on his way, Ananias responded, wait a minute, Lord, wait. You want me to go to Damascus to meet Saul of Tarsus? I heard of this fellow. This is a cutthroat guy. He's slinging knives and taking names that are going to cut your head off. He's stoning people. He's hanging people. But they didn't know that you were changed. Amen. 
I'm going somewhere here. That, 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 that harms you used to do. How you used to be. And because of your past experiences, your past behavior, now they don't think you are usable. But listen to what God says now. Listen to Ananias. I have need of him. All I came by to tell you, church, that God still can use Yeah. 
and transform the people he wants you to be. The Bible says that God says, tell him I have need of him. God needs you. You are usable by God. Watch this. The Bible says gifts are given without repentance. That, that, that is this. You can be gifted and still doing the wrong thing. But God will not take the gift from you. But when you turn your life over to God, He will massage you to use it for His purposes. We have so many gifted people in the church that are sitting down because you know that people are going to talk about you. They talk about you anyway. Oh, that right, that right. Here's the thing. And I, and I think I'm done. And this message was for everybody, but I want to curse brothers. Because I'm a, I'm a black man, and I, I know some of what men deal with. I know some of what men deal with. People always want you to be the perfect person. But what is this, brothers? You got to admit that you can't make an acceptable God. You, you, you can't change you. You cannot fix you. I know you're strong. I know you're mighty. I know you're the bad man on the block. Everybody call me a name. They, they called your name when you were doing your thing. Yeah. They still remember you. Brother Kyle and I went home one day. I'm being real transparent. Help the Holy Ghost. And I was in a barber shop. 29th and Gerard. North Philadelphia. If y'all know what it is, I take you there. I said, Bob, stop sitting in the chair, getting my head lined up. A person sitting in another chair, he looked at me. He said, you chucky, little brother. I forgot who this guy was. Chucky was my oldest brother. Who's a bad guy? I mean, he was, he was, he, I mean, he had respect. If y'all know what I'm saying, he had respect. My brother Chuck been dead about 25 years or more now. But because of his reputation, they still remember him. A guy said to me, well, who are you? The guy said, no, don't mess with him. He said, I won't ask him who's guy who he is. He said, no, 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 no. That's Chuck, little brother. 